everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I'm going to be doing my May-June reading wrap-up, which primarily comprises of thrillers that are either set in creepy woods or at cutthroat boarding schools. I mean, not every single one of them, but I did notice a theme as I was reading more and more of them. Maybe it's just the books I was choosing, or maybe it's just the time of year, but many of these are creepy woods books or cutthroat boarding school books. This wrap-up also has several books that I think actually illustrate an interesting case study for you writers out there, and that is, I get the question a lot, kind of, well, how, what makes a book YA versus adult, especially if they're teen characters? And several of the books I read very clearly illustrate how you have a book that has teen characters but is adult. Several of the ones I read, the ones mostly set at boarding schools, had teen characters but were very firmly adult thrillers. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. It was definitely interesting for me to read. The first book, which is very firmly a YA book, is Wilder Girls by Rory Power. This was one of my favorite YA reads of the year. I firmly believe this is one of the most impressive 2019 YA debuts. I really hope this book makes a splash. It comes out in just a few short weeks. I loved it. It was so creepy. It was really creepy and super gross. And both of those are compliments. Like, there were parts of this book that just grossed me out so intensely and I delighted in it. So the basic plot is that there is a remote boarding school on a remote island off the coast of Maine and something has happened. The island and all the people on it have been infected by something called the tox. It's not incredibly clear what it is, and it, they don't know exactly what it is. The entire island has been quarantined, including all of the girls at the school, and they have been liaising with the U.S. Army, who sends them, uh, Army and Navy, who send them supplies, and are trying to figure out what the tox is and find a cure. The tox basically ravages the girls' bodies. It tweaks the DNA of everything on the island. So all of the foliage, all the trees and nature are growing out of control and twisting. All of the animals are having kind of a grotesque modifications and they become very aggressive. Nothing is safe on the island and the girls are changing as well. Those who survive, many of them died. The main POV character really is heady, like you're mostly seeing things through her perspective, but there are some chapters that are from Byatt's point of view, another girl and kind of the girl trifecta of friendship. Hetty, her eye has swollen shut and she can like feel something moving back there. That's her main kind of alteration. Byatt basically has like an extra ridge of spine. And then Reese has like a silver hand, like her hand has been become kind of deformed. It's like sharp and silver and she glows. She's basically luminescent. And that's just some of them. Some of the other girls grow gills. Some of them drop dead from the talks, but everyone has their body kind of changing in this like animalistic nature grotesque way. And if you've seen or read Annihilation, you see where that comparison comes in. And that was actually my one of my favorite parts of Annihilation. I was fascinated by that aspect of the body horror. Didn't always want to look at it, but I was really fascinated thinking about it. And the same thing applies to Wilder Girls. I loved trying to kind of wrap my brain around this idea of your DNA being fundamentally altered and kind of your body changing and what that means. And it's really terrifying when you think about it, this idea that you're living in this place and your body starts changing against your will. And everyone's also starving. There's not enough food and there's only two adults left. Everyone else has died and it's real intense. The action kicks off when our main character, Hetty, is assigned to boat duty. Boat duty is the crew of three plus one teacher who goes to get supplies that the Navy drops off at the pier and bring them back. This creates a divide with Reese, who is kind of her love interest. The, the book is very firmly, but also low key queer. Like, like it's firmly queer. They're queer, but it's not the main thrust of the story. But Reese is essentially Hetty's love interest. Um, but Reese really wanted to be on gun duty. 
because her father was like the groundskeeper for the boarding school and shortly after the talks hit he disappeared and so she's been wanting to get out the gates and find him ever since he disappeared so she really wanted that spot on boat duty and she resents Hetty for getting it and they get into a fist fight it's all pretty pretty hardcore and then their friend Byatt disappears so things get really creepy I don't want to say more because spoilers, but the book is essentially, it's very creepy and atmospheric. It's about kind of changes and there is a main thrust of mystery. I was definitely turning the pages, trying to figure things out and like see where it was going and where did buy it go to and what did it mean? But that's also not really the point of the novel. It has a firm page turning plot. But it's more than the plot, if that makes sense. So if you really like those kinds of books, character driven, tone driven, world driven, really, the, there was a, the broader world of kind of the island and the talks and the social dynamics, the really messed up social dynamics, where you basically have a bunch of teenage girls and only two adult women trying to survive on an abandoned island uh, where everything can kill you. Um, loved it. I just loved all of that. And it also has just really strong writing. Some of the strongest writing I've read in a really long time, which sounds so patronizing to even say, but you, but you know this channel, you know me, I don't have the strongest writing, meaning you don't have to have like beautiful prose to write a very good and engrossing YA novel. But this is a case where there's also very beautiful prose. Beautiful, but not purple. It was spare and, and intricate in all the right ways. I love just reading the sentences on the page. And it's one of those 2019 YA books, if you've heard some hype for it, the hype is deserved. Like the hype is legit. It is a wonderful, wonderful book if you like this kind of book. I moved from one Creepy Woods book to another Creepy Woods book. The next book I read was Never World Wake by Marisha Pessel. This was the first one I read that was such a fascinating and apt case of the dividing line between YA and adult. This one kind of straddles it in a way that some of the other titles I'm going to talk about a little later are very firmly adult only. This one straddles it, but I would personally say that this is not a YA novel. And it was marketed and published as a YA novel, but Marisha Pussell is a famous adult literary writer, like adult speculative writer. Her previous book that got a ton of buzz was Night Film. You might have heard of it. Haven't read it, but kind of want to now that I read this. I gave Neverworld Wake a very firm four stars. I had a few quibbles that kept it from five for me, though they're pretty minor, but we're going to talk about how to tell a story. So you know how I have a whole video about narrate versus dramatize and how hearing Lainey Taylor kind of put it that way kind of like blew my mind a little and opened something up for me as a writer? This book is the best illustration I may have ever read of the difference between narrate versus dramatize. 90% of Neverworld Wake is narration. Very little of it feels like vivid dramatization. I felt an incredible sense of distance reading Neverworld Wake, and that's why for me it feels more adult than it does YA. Even though the main character is about 19 years old and it's in first person. I have never felt so much distance in a first person narration because most of the first person I read is YA and most YA is incredibly internal and very kind of vivid. I think kind of narration as a primary style is more common in adult. Now, once I kind of got over the fact that I felt this incredible distance, I was sucked in by the speculative premise. The main premise is, the main character, B, hasn't seen her friends from the exclusive boarding school she attended. See, again, boarding schools, but there's also woods in this book. In a year, their senior year, they their friend and her boyfriend died, and no one ever figured out what happened to him. Everyone said it was suicide, but B has just had this unsettling feeling that someone murdered him, essentially. And she wants to know what happened the night he died, because the night he died, she couldn't find any of her friends, and she's convinced they've been lying. But they just kind of drifted naturally apart after they graduated. 
Bee's been at college working at home over the summer for her parents. Towards the end of the summer she gets an invitation from her old friends that they're doing their old tradition of basically like a last Labor Day weekend at this fancy schmancy estate that one of them owns and they invite her and she decides to actually go because she's going to basically try to give them the third degree and grill them and find out what actually happened to her boyfriend the night that he died. They hang out and it's a little awkward, but then they get blind drunk, they go out, they drive home, and, but, they almost get into an accident on the way home. It's raining, it's terrible, but they're fine, and they drive home. Except when they get home, there's a very weird man there, and he tells them that they're dead and that they are in the Neverworld wake. And that basically only one of them can live. And in the Neverworld wake, they have to vote who's going to live. And they can only get out of the Neverworld wake when they come to a uh, unanimous decision. Everyone's like, you're a freak, you're crazy. <coughs> and they ignore it. But then they get to the end of, I believe it's like 11 hours of a set time. And the day starts over again. And it's got this kind of Groundhog Day feel. It's a really weird book. And I liked it. I liked how odd it was, but it was really weird. Weirder than I expected. And so essentially you have like a Groundhog Day sci-fi premise where they're basically dead, but they're in, in this book, what is called The Neverworld Wake. It's like purgatory. But what's really fascinating that I really liked is the Neverworld Wake is basically formed out of the memories, personalities, and quirks of the five of them. I think it's five. It's only been like a month since I read this. Things fly out of my brain. But the point is, it adds the creepiness where there are like weird things going on and you realize, oh, that's because of this person, which leads to one of the weirdest parts of the book. There's time travel, kind of. That's the thing. This is a bonkers, sci-fi speculative novel. And as I said, there's a ton of distance in it. This is where the narration style came in because you get all of this through B telling you. And there are wide swaths of the narrative that are just B going over all of these wakes. It repeats over and over and over again. And of course, the smartest way to write that is to gloss over most of it, because if you forced us to trudge through a dramatization of all of that, it would be terrible. But because of this, that's why there was that distance. And it doesn't start to get into more like dramatization, like feeling like you're there with the characters doing things until probably the last third of the novel. And the last third of the novel, I think, is probably the best part of the novel. So it does kind of pick up and course correct itself. But I did feel incredible distance reading this for a huge part of it where I wasn't strongly attaching to the characters the way that I prefer to. And it's just kind of a reading preference thing. But ultimately, the reason I gave it a very solid and satisfied four stars is I liked the way it all came together. The way the story was told ended up making complete sense. I liked all the weird speculative twists. Every time I thought I knew exactly what she was doing and getting a little bored, there's only so much Groundhog Day you can do, she'd do another weird twist and it worked. And it has a very satisfying ending. I cried. That's always a good sign. I th I really think the end for me, it, it was, it felt very earned. But yeah, it was very odd. So I recommend this for you if you like odd books, speculative, and in this case, what I would call more of a YA crossover. I really wouldn't firmly call this a YA. It's very clearly an adult speculative author who's writing a book with younger characters. They're technically teens, but only because they're 19. They were a year out of high school. They're in college. There are some flashbacks to when they were at school, but it never firmly feels like a YA to me. But that can honestly be a selling point for many readers who are more comfortable in adult speculative fiction and are maybe a little iffy about YA, I, I think it's a really good read. But if you are a more traditional YA reader, you might not like it for some of the reasons I mentioned, the distance and the oddness, honestly. I Very few YA books are this odd. The next book I read was The Lovely and the Lost by Jennifer Lynn Barnes, Creepy Woods theme again. This one like literally takes place almost primarily in the woods. I loved it. Five stars. 
I have never read a Jennifer Lynn Barnes book and I feel like that is a mistake on my part. I need to read more of her canon. She's published a ton of books. Pretty solid city name in YA and I recognized it which is why I requested on Neck Alley and the description appealed to me. The main character Kira was found in the woods as a child. Her adopted mother is a search and rescue um, professional. She trains search and rescue dogs and occasionally goes on search and rescue missions to find people who have gotten lost in like the woods and whatnot. And so she found Kira as a child. She was very wild um, and very psychologically damaged having been wandering the woods for weeks, but she somehow survived. So she's adopted um, by her mom and she has a, a brother and they all train rescue dogs and basically her adopted mother's estranged dad shows up and says, there's a girl missing on the mountain and recruits her and the kids to come to this mountain town. I can't remember where it was set, which is sad. I want to say Montana or one of the Dakotas. Um, in fact, maybe it didn't even say it's by a national park and they are recruited to come and try to find this five year old girl who went missing from a campsite. What I loved about this book, I loved a lot about this book. Um, the number one thing for me, is I felt so fully immersed in the world. And I don't know if Jennifer Lynn Barnes trains search and rescue dogs. I assume she doesn't because it's a very niche life aspiration. I assume this is a case where an author found something really interesting and did a ton of research and then poured all of that into a book. And I loved it. I felt so fully immersed in this world. There are like three main dogs in the book or four. I loved those dogs. I loved them so much. The book like really talked about how they trained them and you know, Kira and her relationship with the different dogs. Like there was the one who found her when she was a girl and they had a deep emotional connection. And then she had her other like goofy puppy who she was training her other dogs. And I freaking love those dogs. I was fascinated by every single detail of how they trained search and rescue dogs when they were on the search and rescue parts of the book. I was just like, on the edge of my seat. I loved it. I have to give you a trigger warning. However, it's very important to know going into this book because does the dog die? And it was a very important thing for people who love dogs and are reading a book that has dogs. This is a trigger warning with an asterisk. A dog does die in this book. If you can't handle it, you can't handle it. The dog doesn't die horribly. I think that's important to say the dog dies of old age. And it's a cathartic emotional point for the character. The dog is honored and well respected and no other dogs die. So that's like my warning there. Like when it happened with the dog, I was, I cried a little, but you're supposed to oh, puppy, such a good puppy. That's the thing. I felt emotions reading this book. I just really liked it. And I felt very in Kira's head. She's a very closed, off psychologically damaged character. I felt it. I cared for her. She goes on a really interesting journey and arc in the book because essentially searching for this girl drags up things from her own past. It's not a straightforward thriller, but it is a mystery. There is a, a mystery thread in the book and there are some red herrings and kind of interesting characters. It has a big finish with a bad guy with a villain. Um, but I just loved it for kind of the, the niche world details, like a teen girl and her family go like who train search and rescue dogs and trying to find this little girl and kind of the twists and turns of finding the girl. And like, is there a serial killer? Like it's that kind of stuff. Um, I loved her relationship with her, her brother. I loved her relationship with her mom, her adoptive mom. I loved the dogs. Um, I just really liked it. I thought it was a really good, just pretty straightforward read. So if you just want a very solid, well-crafted YA kind of mystery with some good characters, highly recommend it. Okay, next we get into two books where I had more mixed critical feelings. And the funny thing is I actually started one, had trouble getting into it and put it on pause to read the next one. So I'll talk about the one I actually finished next. So that is The Husband's Secret by Leanne Moriarty. So you might know that name because she's super famous for Big Little Lies, uh, the miniseries on HBO. I haven't read that book. So this is the first of her books I've read and it happens to be her first book. So I picked up The Husband's Secret and I read it. I gave it a nice 
four stars. Pretty solid four stars. It is multi POV. I think it was in third person. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was in third person. Maybe it wasn't. But the point is it follows a small cast of interlocking characters. So characters who you discover, of course, over the course of the story have connections to each other. And the main thrust of the narrative is that one of the women, one of the main characters, she finds a letter that her husband wrote after their daughter was born. It had been kind of lost and tucked away in a corner and she finds it. And it's basically was meant to be read upon his death. And she finds it and tells him about this funny letter that she found. And he's like, oh, it's stupid. It's not important. Like, you don't need to open it. Please don't open it. And she listens to him until he gets even cagier about it. And then she doesn't listen to him for good and opens it and finds out he had a dark secret that it, he confesses to in this letter that he wrote uh, something he wanted to be known in the event of his death. And of course, it ties into this stuff going on with other characters. There's Cecilia, who's kind of like the main character, though they're all main characters. So she has her hot husband who wrote the, the letter with the secret and her three perfect children, her three daughters. There is Tess, who used to be from the same part of Sydney where Cecilia lives, but she moved away. But at the beginning of the book, she finds out that her husband is in love with her cousin Felicity, and it throws a bomb in their marriage, and she takes their child and goes back home to Sydney to stay with her mom for a while. And then there's Rachel. Rachel is an older woman. She works at the private school, church school, where Cecilia's children go, and Tess ends up enrolling her son. So that's kind of like the connection point for all of them. They're all from this particular neighborhood and all attended this specific Catholic school. And Rachel's tragedy is that her daughter died um, her senior year of high school. She was murdered and found on a playground and it has haunted her ever since. And the anniversary of her daughter Janie's death is coming up. And so these three characters kind of intersect and you know, their, their three stories merge at a certain point. So I liked the three perspectives. I felt fully immersed in each of them. I felt deep like empathy for each of them, even when there were points of their characters that I either definitely couldn't relate to in my real life or just annoying things like Rachel, is so myopically focused on her grief from 30 years ago um, and is hyper focused on the idea that one specific person murdered her daughter and got away with it. And he is a PE teacher at the Catholic school and he ends up dating Tess in the book. So another way that all the characters intersect and you as the reader know that he didn't kill her. And so like as a reader, it's really frustrating because Rachel is so like, she's like determined to punish him. And it's there, there are reader frustrations of, of that sort in the book, but like, it's all good. It's good writing. It's, it's, I felt things. Um, I was definitely fully engrossed, but it's hard for me to talk about the reason I had hesitations. And this is a four star read rather than a five star read without spoilers. So this is going to be a spoiler section. Some of it is more spoilery than other bits of it. The two primary things I kind of had problems with that just kind of impacted my reading experience. These are, well, they're both subjective, but one of them I think is worse than the other and a, a more objectively bad. So Spoilers. The, the, the two issues I had with the book. The first one is fat phobia. There is a streak of fat phobia in the book that is actually a plot point. And this one, I'm less sure how I feel about it because I'm less sure about the intent and the impact of it. So essentially Tess, that character whose husband has fallen in love with her cousin Felicity, the whole crux of that storyline is that Felicity used to be fat. Felicity was her fat cousin, her fat cousin who no one could ever love. And she was kind of her sidekick and they're like inseparable because Tess doesn't have other friends. And the idea that basically Felicity lost a ton of weight and got hot and pretty. And then her husband fell in love with her. And uh, there were times where Tess's, the way that she would talk about Felicity was really fucking gross. I am a fat person, newsflash. I'm a fat person. I've always been fat. And specifically slight trigger warning talking about this. So the book uses numbers. And I think that's always the dangerous thing when you're talking about a fat person. Um, anytime you use numbers, the person's going to be like, well, that's not even that fat. And here's the thing. Felicity wasn't even that fat. And I know it's not about how fat per a person is. And that's the thing. The fat phobia is bad, no matter how fat Felicity was, but what particularly rankled for me is what they give numbers. And I'm like, 
that girl was smaller than me and she's apparently too fat to love, which is a crock of bullshit, by the way. I really hate that cliche. I hate that trope of the fat pretty girl who can't find a man. It's complete bullshit, to be com completely honest. Long story short, and I also hate the trope where the fat girl gets skinny and she it, suddenly people see how pretty she is and now men want to sleep with her, which is the character of Felicity, essentially. Uh, and she stays thin, which, yay. But here's the thing. I was reading it and feeling uncomfortable with it because Tess is quite cruel about how she used to be fat. She keeps calling her obese, in fact. She doesn't call her fat. She wasn't obese. That's mm, numbers. Um, and I think it's actually meant... The way it's used in the text, I think it's actually meant for you to go, wow, Tess is a bitch. I actually think that's the intention, which is where I feel conflicted because I'm like, well, she achieved that intention. It definitely was a character flaw for Tess. It, it made her less of like a perfect, sweet character, which is good. It gives her dimension, but I'm also kind of like, I still wasn't really comfortable with it. So I'm a little mixed on it. It did bother me, but I also see the authorial intent and it's not bad kind of wish it hadn't ended with and Felicity stayed thin and finally was happy with a man. Yay. Not the husband. Uh, I digress. The thing that actually, it didn't ruin the book for me, but it soured my perspective on the book at the very end. This is the thing that I actually think is a problem. And I will link down below to all my Goodreads reviews for these books. I wrote about this in my review in a bit more detail. So the real crux of the thing with the husband's secret that bugs me is it's ableist. It's not like an ableist garbage fire. I've read worse books. I've seen worse books in media. But there was something about the primary function of the twist and part of the ending that just felt really gross to me as I was reading it. So the crux of the big finish in this book, and as a reader, you can kind of see the train crash coming. You know something terrible is going to happen because Rachel is convinced that Connor Whitby murdered her daughter. You as the reader know that Connor didn't murder her daughter. You know it was Paul, Cecilia's husband. And there's this scene where Rachel is in her car and she sees Connor crossing the street and she just decides to run him over with her car. But the Cecilia and her family are in the park and her little daughter, Polly, goes running toward him, like calling his name and, and she wants to talk to Mr. Whitby. And Rachel runs Polly over with her car instead of Connor. And at first I was like, oh shit, she's gonna die. It's like the karmic justice of Paul murdered Janie, Rachel's daughter, and then Rachel murders Polly, Paul's daughter. Like, but instead what it ends up being is that Polly loses her arm. Polly becomes disabled, essentially. She lives, but she loses her arm. Her mother, the character Cecilia, has a moment in the ER when she finds this out, when the doctor tells them where she understandably has a very strong reaction and says to the doctor, but she can't live without her arm. And the doctor says, yes, she can. And when I got to that, I was like, okay, I still don't like that giving this child a disability is literally a plot device. It is a karmic plot device for this book. But maybe she's going to take the best possible tack you can take when you're using disability as a plot device. And the point is that Cecilia has ableist notions and she will be disavowed of those notions in, in our big finish at the end of the book. That didn't happen. And the way in which it didn't happen is the book uses a plot device a few times, but particularly in essentially an epilogue. And it is an omniscient narrator who tells you what would have happened to the characters in the book if XYZ had been different and or what does happen to them. In the case of Janie, who was murdered when she was 17, it's like a section which says what her life would have been like if she hadn't died. And in the epilogue, it, it has a whole thing where it's like, little did they know that Janie had a heart condition and that's what killed her. Ooh, they'll never know. And then it kind of does like a what if for several of the characters, as well as a what actually for several of the characters. And what I really didn't like for a few of the characters, especially Tess, it had a kind of, and this is what their life ended up being. And it was like, there was, it, it, it sounds silly to say, but there was like agency in the omniscient epilogue for those characters, for Connor as well but not for Polly. There's a single paragraph about Polly, the little girl who loses her arm and becomes disabled. 
And it basically says if she hadn't been hit by a car and if she hadn't lost her arm, little did they know her birthday present would have been a tennis racket from her aunt and she would have become a tennis pro. She would have been a world famous tennis player if she hadn't lost her arm. And that's it. And what really bothered me about that is that we got positive and hopeful, but their lives turned out great updates for all the other characters. But not for Polly. We're left with the tragedy porn of, oh no, she became disabled and everything was bad. Her life was garbage because she didn't live her destiny. And it would have been as simple as the author giving Polly a better ending. Just give her a good life. Have a note that like Polly ended up doing something really cool because she lost her arm. It's just kind of, it, it reduces that character, the character who is given a disability by the plot, to tragedy porn, to ableist disability porn. And it just really left a bad taste in my mouth because otherwise it was a really solid book and a solid read, aside from the fat phobia, which did bother me a little bit. And so it just kind of like left me a little, a little bit sad, but it was a good book. It was well told. It was a very specific kind of like women's fictiony mystery that uh, when you're in the mood for it is a really good read. And I'm definitely interested in reading more of Leanne Moriarty's books, uh, even though I know the whole ending because I watched the miniseries, I'll probably read Big Little Lies. And if you do like those kinds of books, kind of the multiple characters who all relate to each other, women's fictiony uh, suspense, uh, it was a pretty good book. Okay, so time to talk about the one book I really didn't love. I didn't hate it. I just didn't love it. It is so far for me the lowest rating I've given to a book that I've read so far in this series, and that is, I gave it three stars. The book is Good Girls Lie by J.T. Ellison. This comes out later in the year in December, and this is an adult thriller, and this one is the perfect illustration of it is definitely an adult thriller, even though it should theoretically be YA, but it's good that it's not because it utterly fails as a YA novel. Uh, it utterly fails at depicting teen characters, in fact, and that's what I'm going to talk about. But uh, essentially, it takes place at a an exclusive girls boarding school in Virginia. And this girl from the UK, Ash, arrives after her parents have tragically died to start fresh at this boarding school. And there are secret societies at the school and like girl politics. And you know, based on the beginning, it starts with uh, omniscient third person telling you that this girl has died. Ash ha is dead. She's hanging from the school um, gates. And then it goes into Ford, the headmaster's perspective. So that's one key already to this is not a YA novel, it's an adult novel. It's a multi POV novel. It has omniscient narrative sections. It has third person sections, and then it has first person uh, sections. The majority of the book is first person from Ash's point of view, who is the teen character, but it never feels like a YA novel. So you know that something really bad happens to Ash and you get chapters. I forgot also, I mentioned Ford, the headmaster, the 35 year old headmaster. You do get chapters from her point of view, um, third person, I believe, if I remember correctly. And then you also get POV chapters from Kate, who is a police detective who comes in later. So I had problems with this book. For me, it boils down to, I really hate it when an author, and it's usually an older author, this isn't me being ageist, it just, this commonly happens, where an author, usually older, clearly is drawing from and wants to draw from older experiences, the experiences they had when they were a younger person. But instead of writing a historical novel, they try to set it now, and they do cheats and workarounds for things like technology and, well, teens, particularly technology. And it feels like a cheat. And as a reader, it just feels really inauthentic. And this was a perfect example of that. Where essentially, from the word go, I never felt like any of the teenagers in this book were teenagers. I never felt like it was set in the year 2019. It felt like a throwback. Everything about it felt like it should take place in the 80s or the early 90s at best. Very early on in the book, there's an interaction between the Dean Ford, who again is 35, my age, she's my age, and the girl Ash, who is 16 years old, 
there's an interaction where the dean basically says to her, oh, hey, I saw that you're not on social media. That's good. And the 16-year-old in the year of our Lord 2019 says, goodness, no. And then basically says that she thinks social media is a waste of time. And there are also privacy concerns. And I was like, what grandma is this? I mean, first of all, that the 35-year-old dean runs a school where we're meant to believe in the year of our Lord 2019, where the children of the elite are sending their children that there are no mobile phones, no cell phones. Cell phones aren't allowed on campus at all. Like the students can't even have them in their rooms. No cell phones whatsoever. That's bullshit point number one. Bullshit point number two is that, yeah, they can have computers and they have the internet, but there's an internet where they limit the websites they can go to, like it's China or something. And I'm like, no, that, no, <laughs> that wouldn't happen. So that's two points where I was like, this is completely unrealistic. You write anything set after the year really 2000, I don't think you can get away with teens not having cell phones. And especially that the dean is meant to be 35. I'm considered a digital native. I grew up with this technology. I grew up with cell phones and the internet. They are an intricate, and social media, they are an intricate part of my life. And I can't see someone my age unless they're a complete Luddite and kind of an asshole enforcing this Luddite mentality on an entire school full of girls. But again, they wouldn't get away with it because these rich girls would just complain to their parents. It would just simply never happen. So that was one thing where I was like, plus just in the internal thoughts and the dialogue, none of the teens sound like teens. They, they don't sound like modern teenagers. They don't sound like them. They don't think like them. Just total, I was unable to suspend disbelief in that sense. Even though this is an adult genre novel, I still feel like the teen character should think and act like teens. The other thing that just really killed it for me so this book involves college admissions, just a little bit. It mentions college admissions and every single thing it says about college admissions is wrong. Every, everything is wrong. The author didn't even Google things. There's a point where the Dean says that 90% of every single senior class gets into the Ivy League and every class is 50 girls. So that's 40 girls going to eight Ivy League schools. That's five per school. That just would never happen. Even Exeter, one of the best boarding schools in the country, competitive, has about a 30% admission rate to the Ivy League. They have larger classes, but still, there's only a certain percentage of students that each Ivy League is going to accept, that the Ivy Leagues as a whole are going to accept from a school. So it's just completely unrealistic that 90% of the graduating class would go to an Ivy League. I, I just thought it was dumb, mostly. But then later, the dean says two things that relate to early admission. On the first day or the first week of school senior year, she says that a senior already has her admission to Harvard. Would never happen. Applications aren't even due until October, November. So there's literally no way for that particular character to have already been accepted to Harvard. She's also not an athletic recruit, so there are no likely letters involved here. And then to a different character, she says, so the character Ash is a sophomore. And she says to someone, oh, Ash can just apply to Harvard next year and get in, you know, to get it out of the way. I'm like, no, she couldn't. That's not how it works. Maybe if she's graduating a year early, which wouldn't make her a junior, it would make her a senior. Rage. Um, it, this sounds small, this sounds like a quibble, but to me, it's an author who took zero care to look up anything. And I'm also pretty sure that's not how Ivy League admissions worked in the 80s either, when this author would have been in high school. So it's just some crock of bullshit. There was also a thing where the main character is supposed to be an impressive hacker and she does Java. And I was just like, really? Not Python or Ruby? Okay, just really inauthentic. And that's the thing. I was, I trooped through this book. I, I'm only talking about the bad things, but here's the thing. It actually had a good soapy mystery plot. If this book had been set in like 1991, it would be a wonderful soapy mystery book. It felt like a throwback novel. It felt like the soapy mysteries that were published in the 90s. And that's not a bad thing. The problem is it's being published now in the current adult thriller market as a book that's allegedly set in 2019. But if you divorce all the inaccuracies, basically, it's a solid book. But the inaccuracies really got in the way of my enjoyment. When I finished it, and I did finish it, it gets to about the 50% point, and then it all picks up and it gets better. And there's some decent twists, though I, I guess the mean twist. It was really obvious from the first couple of chapters. But 
I got to the author's note and she said she based the school on her women's college from which she graduated in 1991. I was like, oh, it all makes sense. And again, I wish this book had been set in 1991 because you, you wouldn't have to have any awkward workarounds with technology. The dean being 35, 35 felt different in 1991 than it does in 2019 because there's a lot of kind of arrested development with the millennial generation and you know just because of economics and all sorts of things. So there was also <laughs> Just talking about things being outdated. The Dean is uh, working on a romance novel. She's an aspiring romance novelist. And she's really hung up on the idea that she has to move to New York become, to become a successful novelist, which was yet another thing that made it feel like it should have been set in 1991. Because that would have been true in 1991. And in 2019, it's not. She could just put a book on Amazon and make a lot of money. Uh, so lots of like little things. And then I do have to let people know, if it sounds like these inaccuracies wouldn't really bother you, you might enjoy the book as like a soapy gothic mystery. This book also does have a queer plot line. And I say this with an asterisk. There is a queer plot line where the main character is queer. And there's another character who is also queer. Um, it's implied that the main character is bi and then her love interest is a lesbian. And there is kind of that through line in the book. But again, the queer plot line felt very dated. It felt very 1991. Again, if it had been set in 1991, it would have been pretty pitch perfect with the way that like the girls felt about their, their sexuality and the unfolding of it and kind of the levels of secrecy. But again, set in 2019, I just had a bit of pause. So that's kind of that. So I gave it a set, I gave it three stars on Goodreads, kind of, I rated it a 3.5 rounded down, but it, it might just be a three for me because there was good craft in the actual story itself and the mystery. And also two of my favorite things about this book, there were things I genuinely liked about this book. It was hard to get into, but once I got into it, I liked the pacing and my favorite point of views in the book, I liked the adult characters. I liked all of the stuff from Ford the Dean's point of view, and I liked the few chapters from Kate the detective's point of view. I actually cared about both of them. I was invested in their stories and I liked their points of view. I would have preferred a book that went full adult, honestly, that was just from the points of view of the adults and didn't try to like really force the teen angle. I think I would have liked that better. I also adored the setting. The setting of the school in rural Virginia was excellent. And when I found out it was based on a real place, I'm like, that makes sense. Every description of the school was so vivid. And it gave it this very interesting tone. It did feel a little bit gothic. And I liked that part a lot. I felt very immersed in the setting whenever I was reading it. And to me, that is a huge plus. I liked all of like the the, the rules with the classes and like the creepy attics and the spiral stairways definitely had that gothic feel. But yeah, ultimately for me, this one didn't quite land, especially as a boarding school book that had the vague trappings of YA, but is definitely not a successful execution of, of kind of teen characters in the year 2019. Next, I read Lock Every Door by Riley Sager. This one is about a girl. She's down on our luck. She is an orphan. Her parents died tragically and her older sister went missing before her parents died. And she moved to New York and got a job and had a boyfriend. And on the same day that she lost her job, she found her boyfriend cheating. So she's been bumming a spot on her friend's couch for weeks and she's been looking for a job. She sees an advertisement for an apartment sitter and she responds to it and cannot believe her luck. It is this gorgeous building called the Bartholomew. It's very famous. It is the setting of her favorite book, actually, The Heart of a Dreamer, which is a kind of romantic story about a girl who moves to New York and finds love in this beautiful old building. And so she jumps at the chance to apartment sit for three months. It pays insanely well. She gets $12,000 if she stays, $1,000 a week is great because her bank account is almost empty. But there are some rules that she has to follow. So she can't have guests over. She has to spend every night in the apartment. And she's not supposed to talk to the residents because they're rich and they're famous. And you know, they don't want the riffraff mingling. So she moves in and it's beautiful and wonderful. She meets two of the other apartment sitters. And then on the second day that she's there, or after the second day that she's there, it's the third day, one of the apartment sitters that she kind of hit it off with as a friend, Ingrid, goes missing. She goes missing after Jules had heard a scream in her apartment. See, her apartment is connected to the one below it. 
through a dumb waiter. So she heard a scream, went downstairs, and talked to Ingrid through the door. Ingrid seemed a little weird, but she insisted that everything was fine. But then by the next morning, she's gone. So Jules starts investigating. She's convinced that there's foul play, that something happened to Ingrid. And everything starts to unravel from there. The book is really fun. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. I guessed some things. I didn't guess other things. It has an insane third act. Third act was bonkers and I loved it. Um, it has something to say actually. It, the book actually has something to say about class division because you know you're in this fancy old building and you know the poor people can't talk to the rich people. It's gothic. It has like a gothic edge to it. It reminded me a bit of The Devil's Advocate, if you've seen that movie, or it reminded me also of, I think it was called Park Avenue 666, which was on ABC, you know, where the young couple can't believe their luck in getting this hot apartment in this old building and things are weird. The book isn't paranormal though, but it had that creepy feel, the gothic feel, and part of gothic is paranormal elements, like where things are creepy and kooky, and it definitely had that edge to it. Um, I blew through it. It's one of the better thrillers I've read this year. Enthusiastic five stars. And so I just really loved the writing style. Not because there was anything like super special about it. It was good in, in, in kind of that disappearing sense where it's just clean, good prose where I could visualize things and I felt like I was there with the characters. And that's the thing. What I think Riley Sager is really, really good at is the emotional internal stuff especially tragic characters. I immediately purchased his first book, Final Girls, and I'm halfway through that now, and he's really, really good at damaged women. <laughs> I say that as a genuine compliment. I was reading it, and I got partway through, and I was like, is the author a woman? Because all the women in this are very well drawn. No, he's a guy. And I think it goes to show you really, it's not always about the author. You can be really good at writing something that isn't explicitly what you are. And Riley Sager is very good at writing women, in my opinion. I, even though I'm nothing like any of the, the female characters in the book, I understood them, I could relate to them, and I was fully engrossed in what was happening. Because we get pretty good characterization of not just Jules, but also Ingrid. There are also female residents of the building, like Greta Manville. She wrote the book that Jules loved. She lives in the building and is kind of mean. I just really, I was all in. I was all into it. And there, of course, were moments where I wanted to scream at Jules. I was like, what are you doing? She makes the wrong choices sometimes, but it, it's because the plot needs to happen. Um, really, really good. If you are looking for a solid, just immersive page turning thriller, I'm now a Riley Sager fan and I highly, highly recommend it. And last but not least, I read The Swallows by Lisa Lutz. This is another boarding school book where it's a great illustration of it is solidly an adult novel, even though it has teen characters, including some teen POV characters. This one is kind of like a soapy satire romp. I really liked it. This is another enthusiastic five-star review from me, even though I have tiny, tiny quibbles, but I enjoyed the reading experience so much that I don't care. And this one isn't really a thriller or even a mystery. It's kind of suspense, but not really. But it does have a very propelling plot. The book is multi-POV in various first-person sections, but each section is labeled with the character that you're following, and I found generally very easy to follow. A good example of first-person multi-POV where the characters still felt really distinct, and really the compliment I would pay it is that it very well could have been third-person limited. It felt about the same. One of the main characters is Alex Witt. She comes to Stonebridge Academy as a creative writing teacher, reluctantly. Her dad is a famous novelist and he hooked her up with this job after she was dismissed in disgrace from her last job. And she lands in this place, this third-rate boarding school where everything's bonkers, to be honest. So essentially this book is satire question mark in the sense that this school is brazenly sexually debauched. It's basically crazy boarding school antics. So the other POV characters, mate primary one is Gemma Russo. So she's kind of the beautiful rebel and she's part of the popular crowd, which calls themselves the 10, which is comprised of like the 10 best students in each class, like best being like coolest. It's 
Bit of a stretch, wasn't one of my favorite parts of the book, but essentially the boys are all louses. <laughs> there is something called the Dulcinea competition, which is basically a blowjob competition that all of the girls unwittingly participate in. Some of them do find out about it, so Gemma knows about it. And ever since she found out about it, she's been determined to take down the boys, to destroy the whole system. The boys have a secret website called The Dark Room, and the main boys who judge the blowjob competition are called the editors. <laughs> It's a little much. There's a lot of, you know, all of these proper nouns and secret groups and all that kind of stuff. And then there's also Finn Ford, who is another teacher at the school, and his POV is basically meant to be there. He is like a grown-up douchebag version of these, these younger guys. He's there as kind of a contrast. And there's also Norman Crowley, who is also a senior, and he's done all the coding for the dark room for the Dulcinea for the blowjob competition, and he feels really bad about being involved in this group at all. He's kind of reluctantly a part of this group, and so he ends up kind of helping the girls. And that's how this all kicks off. Um, Alex Witt basically assigns a creative writing assignment to kids. It's, it's anonymous. It's answer these four questions. It's like, who are you? What do you love? What do you hate? Etc. And she actually uses these anonymous uh, assignments to figure out who people in her classes are. She can usually peg them to certain students, but under what you love and what you hate, most of the girls wrote that they hate blowjobs. They hate the dark room. And most of the boys wrote that they love the dark room. And so the teacher starts to figure out that something is really fucked up at this school, and she ends up allying herself with Gemma and a couple other girls, and it turns into the back cover copy described it as a gender war, which I guess is accurate, but it's basically this spiraling, soapy, like, revenge story, kind of. Um, I really loved it because it had a very punchy writing style. It was very, you know, I keep saying that it's satire, but it definitely had kind of that punchy writing style. But yeah, it was kind of brisk and breezy, and in particular the female characters, I really liked them. On paper, you could totally describe them as manic pixie dream girls, meaning in the hand of a different author, they totally would be. They're kind of stereotypes of strong women. They have big opinions and they, you know, Gemma's a little like emo and Alex like doesn't give a shit and they're kind of devil may care. But Lisa Letts draws them as complex, vulnerable, well-rounded women. And I, I really enjoyed following their perspectives, even though I have nothing in common with either of them. I really felt for them as I was in their perspective and I liked following the story through them. And generally the thing is, if you go into the book knowing that it's completely over the top and most of it's kind of bullshit, like I know that stuff happens, especially at boarding schools, it's one of my favorite tropes, um, but the level of kind of sexual exploits and antics and the ways in which the teens kind of act like adults in a lot of ways, it's like they have it both ways. Some of the stuff they do is very adult, but they still emotionally are like teenagers, which I guess is the good combination. But um, you just kind of have to go, you know, this is a ridiculous, soapy, over-the-top boarding school book. And if you let go of that and kind of throw yourself in, it's a really enjoyable read. So I definitely recommend it if you like boarding school tropes and you want to read a novel with a capital N, because that's always how they label these things. I really enjoyed The Swallows by Lisa Letts. It comes out in September, just in time for a new school year. So that's it. Those are all the books I read. Ton of boarding schools. Lots of them take place in the woods. The Swallows had scenes set in the woods too. Woodsy boarding school books is the theme of this time. Mostly I enjoyed all the books I read. Just a couple of eh in there. One kind of dud. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to continue to like mainline thrillers. I'm already halfway through Final Girls. That'll roll into the next wrap up. You know, it's it's... It's been especially fascinating with this like run of books to see teen protagonists in typically teen settings, boarding schools, but just very firmly adult books. I'm really fascinated by kind of, you know, the similar tropes, but how they're approached differently in adult versus YA in this particular genre. Maybe I'll make a video kind of doing a deeper analysis. If you're interested in something like that, let me know down below in the comments. Give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. I will continue to do my reading wrap ups. I know this is kind of niche content on my channel because I'm not really a booktube channel, but I've been really enjoying reading these books and kind of analyzing them for you. I, I get a real kick out of them. These are becoming some of my favorite videos to make. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching. 
and happy writing.